to start the proceedings, please everyone uh, take a seat. I'll call on Father Phil to uh, give us the invocation for tonight. Father Phil. There we go. Thank you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and to ages of ages. Amen. Let's offer the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and to ages of ages. Amen. Uh, we pray, Lord, as we open our uh, 2020 speaker series, um, year six of the Christian Rights and Freedom Institute, that you will continue to bless and to provide, um, and to nurture in us a love of freedom and a love of knowing and serving you. We ask this in your name, for your holy and blessed, to ages of ages. Amen. You may be seated. Um, I'd just like to take just a, a brief liberty of just sharing just a few things on the background of the organization, the Christian Rights and Freedom Institute. Uh, for those of us who may be here for the first time, um, it's true that our byline is witnessing our faith by peacefully uplifting Christ. And uh, to share something from our website, it says the Holy Scripture reveal that mankind is, is created in the image and likeness of God, as it says in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, has been endowed with the gift of free will. It says in Genesis 2, 16, 17, in the book of Leviticus, the book of Joshua, the book of Ezra. Therefore, freedom is fundamental to our divinely ordained nature and is an inalienable gift from God. The Institute opposes all affronts to this freedom, whatever their evil forms be, uh, whether it's you know, tyranny or oppression or enslavement or injustice or, or its moral decay, whatever may be afflicting mankind in our society. You know, the big thing is we stand for religious liberty and we stand for universal human rights also stand in opposition to Christian persecution and to genocide. It is, I think, very notable that just today the Senate adopted a resolution condemning the Armenian genocide. And we say it's a time. And I think we also understand that it's well overdue that the Greek genocide also be recognized. So this is the kind of thing as we as we think about why we gather and what we do and the messages we're trying to share, it's really about preserving our identity, our history, our faith, our culture, and making sure that we stand up for the right in the face of evil in this world. On that note, I'd like to call Dr. Harry Demopoulos back to introduce our speaker for the day. And it's so lovely to have you with us, Alexander. We're so looking forward to having you, and uh, we've been looking forward to this day for quite some time. So thank you so much. Here's Dr. Harry. So I am Harry Demopoulos, uh, and filling in for our new chairman, uh, who is in Ottawa today, Canada, uh, Steve Ramfos will assume his duties next month. And so uh, we'll introduce you to him uh, when he comes. Uh, so I, as soon as I find it, I just want to tell you a few more things. Okay, so Father already has uh, stolen my thunder and he has told you all about, <laughs> not quite. Uh, but just a reminder again, we are everything he has said, and, and in defense of universal human rights, religious freedom, and so forth, as the slide speaks to and as he uttered so beautifully. So uh, the best record of success uh, uh, for us is really the speaker series that we've had in the last five years. This is our sixth year, 
And over six years, I think we produced about roughly, I would say, 60 to 70 events we put together and brought in various speakers. Uh, and I'm not going to give you a list of every one of those, but I will give you a, a sample so that you have some uh, idea of, uh, of, of our record. And I'll start with this, which is a partial list of speakers we have hosted. Now, I don't claim to be as far-reaching and as famous, if you will, as the Naples Council of World Affairs, whose um, programming director is amongst us. Thank you for coming, Mimi. But, but I will say that among churches, you know, in the nonprofit sense, this is a very uh, exemplary record of speakers we had. And, you know, we start with Jay Sekulow. Uh, so, so the ACLJ has been one of our go-to organizations in order to get speakers uh, and to talk to us, uh, uh, Jay Sekulow, Andrew Konomo, one of the founders of SCLJ, Stuart Roth, another one of the founders, Dr. Limberakis, the founder of the Archons of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, has been our speaker, and he will join us next month, which are in an uh, event that I will describe. Uh, Mike Emanuel has been here a number of times to give us presentations. Uh, Raymond Ibrahim uh, from uh, uh, Egypt, uh, a strong voice for the defense of Christians worldwide. He has been here. Was Dr. Andrew Tabler, fellow of the, uh, in the Washington Institute. Uh, Congressman Francis Rooney, Timothy Patitas has been here and he'll come again in March to give us another lecture. Uh, Jennifer Marshall of the Heritage Foundation. Robert Levy, the chairman of uh, the Cato Institute and fellow Naples, Neapolitan. He lives here. So he's a powerhouse uh, in, in, in the speaker's uh, 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 space, if you will, here in Naples. Robert Spencer was also, uh, he's the managing director of Jihad Watch. John Zavitsanos, uh, he talked to us about the infiltration, let's say, of, of uh, charter schools in America. You, some of you might remember by Islamic uh, influence. So he spoke to us about that. Richard Thompson, the president of Thomas More Law Center in defense of uh, uh, Christian rights. He has been here. Dr. George Dimakopoulos of Fordham. University, and he's coming again next month. He will be here. Dr. Zudi Jasser, famous uh, personality on TV in defense of moderate Islam. Uh, uh, James Towey, the president of Ave Maria University, who is just resigning or uh, his, uh, his term is ending, I think. And he has been a speaker uh, and various metropolitans of our faith, the Greek Orthodox faith, Alexios of Atlanta, Nathaniel of Chicago, Soterios of Toronto, and Gregory of Nyssa. So this is just a third, I would say, of the people. And, and our record speaks through these uh, superb speakers that we had. So a few, uh, a couple of administrative matters before I get to the uh, main event here. There will be a Q&A, and you see um, your uh, microphones on your side. When you do want to ask a question, please walk to the microphone and form a line, and we'll recognize you. Uh, also, to remember, all our lectures are free of charge. There's no fee to come and attend uh, the, the events. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about our next event, so it's on January 18, 2020, at 1 p.m. Saturday, right here in this hall. And what we have is uh, two speakers. Of course, the featured speaker is Lauren Green 
Fox News correspondent, and she'll talk to us about uh, Christian persecution. And she will also be bringing her new book, when new, it's been out about a year, Lighthouse uh, Faith, and she'll be signing the books uh, at the end of her lecture. And then her talk will be preceded by Dr. George Demacopoulos, who is, as I said before, he is in Fordham University, professor of the Orthodox Christian Studies program, and he will discuss the topic of Orthodox unity in America, which is a topic of great interest to, to many Orthodox here in this uh, audience. So for this event, advanced registration is required, uh, and, and this uh, flyer, which you will receive by email, shows you exactly how to go about to register, because without a ticket, you won't be able to get in. So uh, we think we're going to have a full house with um, uh, the speakers of that caliber, and so please register so you can reserve your seat. And now, I um, want to introduce to you uh, our speaker for today, Alexander Bellinis on my right. And he is, of course, no surprise, a Greek-American, but he has such a, a set of talents, he's, he's really impressive. He's, of course, a freelance writer, an author, a lawyer, a banker, he has been, a lecturer on historical, political, economic topics, particularly relating to Eastern Europe. <clears throat> he'll tell us a little bit about himself so you'll know where he gets this particular interest. <clears throat> He's the author of two books. Uh, this is one of them that you can acquire at the end in the back if you're interested. It's called The Eagle Has Two Faces, Journey Through Byzantine Europe. That's one. And the other one is a novel. It's called Hidden Mosaics and Aegean Tale. And that's the other book that he has authored. And in addition to teaching at Clemson University, he's a master's degree candidate at the same school in the Department of History. Uh, he lived and worked in, obviously, in the US, in Serbia, in Britain, in Greece. He likes to travel. His native language is English, but of course he's also fluent in Greek, Spanish, proficient in German, Serbian, Croatian, and conversational Bulgarian, and Hungarian. And there you have eight languages. Okay? He received a JD in international law from the American University and passed the Utah and Illinois State Bar exams he has an MIM from American Graduate School of International Management and a BS in West and East European Studies, School of Foreign Service at Georgia, Georgetown University. The title of his talk is Byzantine Heritage in the Balkans, Hidden in Plain Sight. And ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to present to you Alexander Bilinis. Good evening. Alexandra, dobre večer, buona sera. Let me start by uh, thanking Father Patitsas for his uh, invocation and for my very good friend, uh, Dr. Dimopoulos, for his kind words. It's a great honor to be here to talk to you about a subject that's very important to us and to this organization because in order for us to understand Christianity in the East, because we Orthodox are Eastern Christians, we need to understand Byzantium. It's some, simply something that you cannot do without. And I would submit that those of us who are of Byzantine heritage need to do a better job, first of all, in self-awareness, but in building awareness amongst our fellow citizens, 
because we are the inheritors of an amazing tradition. And when I say 1,000 year old empire, it's actually far more than that. It's the continuation of Rome. So add another 400 years. And even when this empire fell, it continued. The, the French have a term, Byzance après Byzance. Uh, my French is terrible. I, it is not one of the languages that I have, but Byzantium after Byzantium. Something like this does not just die on the walls of Constantinople, like our immortal emperor Constantine Palaiologos. It's simply too powerful. Okay? So what is this inheritance? Well, it's the Greco-Roman Christian civilization that continued after the fall of West Rome, lasted another thousand years. Now, think about what a thousand years means, okay? Greece next year is going to celebrate 200 years of independence. The U.S. is at about 250 years of independence. Our whole settlement of Europeans in the United States is about 500 years. Double that. And think of all the uh, think of all the civilization that we have in this country of ours. And double, or actually quite, yeah, basically double the amount of time. And we're not talking about a static civilization. We are talking about the most advanced civilization in the European Mediterranean basin that inherited all of the strength of ancient Greece and ancient Rome, inspired by the Lord himself and carrying on his tradition. This is a heady, heady tradition, and why do we not talk about it? Sorry. This is an organization that brought the word of God to our Slavic brothers and sisters in their own language. Now, that seems like a no-brainer today, but at the time, that was revolutionary. This civilization did that. And as I said, even after the fall, the identity, civilization, and culture remained during Ottoman rule. They could not destroy it. They had to co-opt it. And they fused the Byzantine peoples even more together only for us and for the other powers to tear us apart later on. But we'll, we'll get into that. And it's still there. Byzantium is there and it's hidden in plain sight. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, think about it. The Greek identity today, Greek speaking, Orthodox Christian, it's all by and large Byzantine, all of our crowd symbols, with the exception of some of the ancient monuments, are all Byzantine. The first picture I had is of Hagia Sophia. Is there any greater reference point for the Greek people than Hagia Sophia that, that expresses the totality? Let's, let's go beyond Greece, of Eastern Christendom. It's that. Does anyone know what the Serbs and Bulgarians call Constantinople? Tsarigrad, the city of the Tsar. There is no other city. The totality that is expressed in that building and in the civilization that that represents is a complete totality. Okay. Look at these flags. Anything familiar there? Go on, shout it out. It's okay. The double-headed eagle. All of these successor states of Byzantium have the double-headed eagle on their flag. The Serbians in particular are worth noting. It's the, it's the one in the middle. Now, I have to confess a certain degree of predisposition towards the Serbs, like most Greeks have a predisposition, but I'm also married to a Serbian, and I've lived in Serbia, and uh, in addition to Greek and U.S. citizens, my children are Serbian citizens. So, yes, I have a bias, so for, uh, forgive me for that, but 
within the Serbian flag, there are two Byzantine symbols because if you see the shield, the four uh, Cyrillic S's, Samo Sloga Serbina Spasava, only unity saves the Serbs. Serbs. It is actually the Byzantine tetragrammaton. Aftoto Vasilio Ineto Vasilio Ton Vasilion. This kingdom is the kingdom of the King of Kings. So within their flag, they have double encoded their Byzantine identity. And again, what is the alphabet that the Serbians primarily use? Cyrillic. The Bulgarians. The newly christened North Macedonians. Right? Cyrillic. And where did Cyrillic come from? Right? All of this is part of their identity, and it's part of all of our collective identity. But I ask you, how often do any of, do Greeks, do Serbs, do Bulgarians, Romanians talk about their Byzantine heritage? When you refer to being Greek or Greek heroes, who are your reference points? You tend to go from 1821 to the present? Or from about, uh, when did Alexander the Great die? Around three something to the past. This is Sparta or uh, Brad Pitt as Achilles, okay? We, we tend to talk about that. When we make references to Greek history and literature, maybe we'll throw in a Kazantzakis, you know, which is great. Uh, in Elitis, uh, you know, Seferis, but often enough we'll go to Homer. You have a thousand years of history, and this was the most literate civilization in the West. Who talks about the Alexiad? By Anna Kamnina. Oh, by the way, a woman author at a time when women were not supposed to read and write. Well, guess what? In Byzantium, often enough they did. That's another thing my wife likes about the Byzantines. Aside from being of Byzantine heritage, you know, that, that women had an important role in society. But why don't we talk about this? I mean, think about it. We mentioned uh, the movie 300 or Brad Pitt as Achilles. Okay, I mean, he, he cuts a good figure. I mean, respect, right? We'd all like to, to look like that. But where are the blockbusters of, about Byzantium? Has anyone seen a movie that depicts the Byzantines? Go ahead. Okay, there are a few, but they're not done by Greeks. They're not done by Bulgarians. They're not done by Serbians. Now, yes, I have seen Serbian documentaries. Actually, very good. The Serbian film is very good. But there are no blockbusters about Byzantium. And think of how many Greeks are in Hollywood. Nothing. How many books are written about Byzantium? Now, I'm an academic now. I've had other iterations of my life. So yes, you can find plenty of books. I mean, the works of Stephen Runciman, of Donald Nickel, they, they are amazing acts of scholarship. But in conventional wisdom, in popular culture, do we ever talk about the Byzantines? Do we ourselves, do, do the depictions of Greece, Greeks refer to the Byzantines? And, and forgive me for this, does Gus Portokalos, when he sits around his table, does he talk about the Byzantines? No, he doesn't. He can't then explain why it's your lucky day to be baptized in the Greek Orthodox Church. If you don't know this, you don't know why, Ian, it's your lucky day you're being baptized into the Greek Orthodox Church. All right, a little bit of humor, but this is real. Okay? This is very serious. I mean, it's good to bring some levity to it, but why don't we talk about this kind of a heritage when we have it? Now, maybe the problem is Greeks, or you know, primarily most of us here are Greeks or partially of Greek background, is there's a lot of heritage. But this heritage is directly related to who we are, 
to our Orthodox faith and to what's going on all over the Eastern Mediterranean. Because remember, those areas were all Christian. How many of them are now? If you don't get this, you don't know why. And you cannot contextualize, first of all, to yourselves and to the next generation, but to your fellow citizens, to your representatives, what Byzantium means and why it's important. Going back to films, I know about one film about the fall of Constantinople. Anyone seen Fatigue 1453? It's a Turkish film. A Turkish friend of mine sent it to me with a post-it note that said, this film is zero. Okay? It was a big-budget, schmaltzy film where Constantine Paleologos was depicted as a conniver, and the Turks were all brave and stalwart, and uh, Mehmet II was a good family man. Right. I mean, I mean, watching this, you just are like, is, are they are they serious? And uh, of course, they fought a heroic and honorable battle. They smote their enemies. And he came into Hagia Sophia in this cowering mass of uh, Byzantines and held a baby. I mean, he'd be a great politician. He was almost kissing the babies. I mean, this is how they portrayed it. The one film about Byzantium. Is that, uh, yeah, okay, I hear the, I hear a buzz there, but this is it. And interestingly, even the Turkish press had a problem with the film because they said that this film shows everybody, particularly our own people, that our greatest city in the Turkish Republic was built by someone else and taken by someone else. So it reminds me of President Obama's term when he said, you didn't build that. Well, guess what, Turks? You didn't build that. Who built it? Our ancestors built it. So <clears throat> when did you study Byzantium? Maybe a few parentheses in college, right? Very, you know, maybe a few paragraphs. My son right now is in AP World History. Uh, he's studying Byzantium. Well, part of it's because a particular parent insisted on that. I won't tell you who that parent is. But let's go back to ourselves. In Greek school, anybody go to Greek school? Come on, right? Did you ever talk about the Byzantines in Greek school? Well, good. That, that makes one of us. In uh, Alada? Okay. Alios, uh, that's parenthesis. In Greece, yes. There is, uh, I don't think Byzantium is given its due in Greece either, but nonetheless, yes. But in Greek school here, no. We know tapimata, you know, we know the poems from the revolution, something about the ancients, this, this uh, interregnum in between, we forget about and we move on. So we're doing this to ourselves, okay? We're doing this to ourselves. We are denying ourselves the story of our people. And I don't understand why we're doing this. So before we broaden this uh, to our, uh, our fellow Balkan brethren, let's look at what the typical timeline of Greek history is. Do we more or less agree with this? We got Minoan, Mycenaean, classical, and we focus heavily on classical, Alexander, Hellenistic, and then all of a sudden, about 2,000 years are sort of almost like a dark ages, you know, Roman, Christian, Byzantine, Turkish. I mean, we throw in Christianity because Christianity is obviously important, but we don't really contextualize it, particularly for the younger generation, how this is part of of a flow and how embedded this is in our civilization. It's just assumed, okay, you're Greek, you go to the Greek Orthodox Church, and if it's your lucky day, you get baptized into it if you, you marry into it. That's it. There's not a contextualization, and I use that word constantly, and my students are used to hearing it, and they roll their eyes. So 
probably by the third time I say, okay, you get the point. But we need to contextualize our history, and it's not being done. So what happens? Where's this? The walls. The walls. That's it. The walls. The walls. I mean, for, for, for Harry, who is, who is born in Constantinople, the walls. But for all of us, these are reference points of our history because those walls kept the civilization going for a thousand years. Those walls protected Europe from Islamic invaders until technology advanced so far that they couldn't do it anymore. Because what did the Turks bring to breach those walls? Cannon, right? But for 1,000 years, our civilization and Western civilization were protected by those walls. So frankly, those are more important than the Parthenon. And even with all respect, than Hagia Sophia, because if you don't have this, you don't have that. Those need to be symbols of our history. That should be as iconic as the Parthenon when you go for your Greek restaurant. That's iconic. And yet, how many of us would know instinctively what that means? How many of the Greek community, of the Serbian community, that should be understood immediately. And that's our responsibility. 2,000 years of Greek history, of Balkan history, of Byzantine history, overlooked. Because remember, Rome was always Greco-Roman in culture. And in the East, Greek was the Roman administrative language. Greeks were Roman, Greeks are Roman, and never ceased to be or to speak Greek. There is no contradiction. It is the same. But we have to understand that, express it, and convey it. If we don't, we don't. So we need to remember these walls. We need to remember Hagia Sophia. What about art? How many of you have been to Constantinople and gone to the upper gallery in Hagia Sophia? and seeing our Savior depicted in a mosaic so beautifully that it looks as if our Savior is drawing breath. No picture does that justice. No picture. You have to actually see it and be amazed. He is drawing breath. Now, obviously, it was inspired by God, but the hands of our ancestors made it. So what happened when the Kievan Rus envoys went in to Hagia Sophia and reported back to Prince Vladimir? They said, sire, we did not know whether we were in heaven or on the earth. The souls of the largest country in the world were conquered by love and by beauty and by art. Divinely inspired, no question. But let's think about that. Let's remember what that art conveyed and what it did. Here's something that my kids get tired of me mentioning when they go to grab something from their plate. And I said, who invented this? <sighs> Our ancestors. <clears throat> the fork. Now, okay, so what? The fork. Okay, what does the fork do for hygiene? Isn't it a little more hygienic, particularly in a time when you didn't have indoor plumbing, to use a fork? Because if you eat with your hands, you might die. Okay, so no, it is important. And I mention it all the time, that yeah, the fork was invented by the Byzantines. And people are like, oh, jeez, okay. But no, it's important, and we should remember it. And we need to talk about it. And my favorite, uh, given my marriage, you can understand why, the conversion of the Slavs, not by force, but by an alphabet army. Now, very interestingly, um, this last Thanksgiving, uh, one of my very close friends came over to our house and brought three friends from the Czech Republic. 
get them to talk about Cyril and Methodius. They said, oh, the apostles of the Slavs, even though they're not Orthodox, they said, oh my Lord, Cyril and Methodius are heroes. We have statues of them everywhere. Those Byzantine brothers, they, if only we had been allowed to flourish because the Germans came in, brought the Pope, brought Latin, and that was over. Not so for the Bulgarians and the Serbians and the Russians. They downloaded an entire history in their own language because the Byzantines, though they thought themselves superior to everyone and their civilization superior, they didn't think that God in his omniscience could only speak Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. That's a little narrow. If God is God, God can speak every language, and for you to absorb the beauty of God's Word, you might want to be able to understand it. And the Byzantines knew this. My next-door neighbor in Clemson is a, um, a Lutheran pastor, a wonderful man, but I said, you know, Luther was great that he translated the Bible from Latin to German. Uh, two brothers from Thessaloniki were translating the Bible about 700 years before. Just a fact, but it's real. We did that. Uh, I already mentioned what these walls did and what the Byzantine armies did. Oh, and by the way, Greek fire, anyone heard of that? Burns on the water and burned the Muslim invading ships to a crisp. Okay, so we, we used asymmetric technologies as well to keep Europe safe. Now, They'll often talk about Charles Martel in the West because, hey, it's the West. What about the East? The Eastern Gate, Leo the Asarian, all the constant uh, fights on the borders of the Akritas. I mean, those are tales that need to be told, right, Harry? Those are amazing stories of heroism and chivalry, and also a degree of interfaith tolerance that is also typical of Byzantium, that was atypical of the West. Because even though we fought tooth and nail against the Muslims, we didn't tend to slaughter like the Crusaders did. So that's an important difference. Uh, and again, I think it's also inspired by the tenets of our faith. Uh, I'm biased, but I think that the historical record uh, certainly supports that. And the Renaissance, okay? Let's not forget that, that Mistra and Constantinople and Boyana and Kosovo, the art there, the thought there prefigured the Renaissance. I made the mistake of mentioning to a Serbian priest in a northern Serbian uh, town where the... Uh, a lot of the architecture is very typically Baroque. That, oh, well, these frescoes look very, you know, look more Renaissance and um, in their style. And he said, young man, are you familiar where the Renaissance came from? He said, it came from us. So it was basically a theory of recycling of our culture back into us. He said, he says, you're a Greek. You should understand very well that Damaskinos and Theotokopoulos, also known in Toledo as El Greco, prefigured the Renaissance. It's all right there. But if we don't talk about it, nobody else is going to talk about it because everyone wants to claim the Renaissance, right? It's kind of cool. So let's go back and look at the historical record and take back what is ours. When, by the way, speaking of the Renaissance, when the Italians wanted to learn Greek, they could go to the villages of southern Italy, many of which still speak Greek, and learn it right there, because they remained Byzantine in their faith until the 15th and 16th century. That's a little uh, parenthesis. I've been to that area. It's, it's fascinating. And then after Byzantium fell, the identity didn't go away. The Turks could snuff us out politically, but culturally, they never could. Now let's go to these two brothers from Thessaloniki, Cyril and Methodius. To me, these two saints need to be up there in the pantheon of 
Hellenic heroes and of Hellenic thinkers. Aristotle, Plato, all wonderful, and we all admire them, and we should admire them. But what about these, what about these two? Conquering the souls of an entire people with an alphabet army. I already mentioned this, but 700 years before Luther, which was such a big revelation in the West, we were doing it in the East. But do we really honor these saints? Who talks about them in Greece? We talk about their DNA because the Bulgarians say they're Bulgarian. Serbs, not often, but sometimes they'll throw in that they're Serbs. The uh, North Macedonians, Scorpions, whatever you want to call them, claim that they're theirs. These were two Byzantine brothers from Thessaloniki. I don't know what their DNA was, right? But they thought themselves as Romans. Did they speak Greek? Yes. Did they speak a Slavic language which was spoken in Thessaloniki and in the environs in adi uh, of the area in addition to Greek? Yes. Right? Because Byzantium was a multicultural, multi-ethnic empire. They didn't think about DNA. They thought a little higher than that. Right? We need to think a little higher than that. These two saints, in addition to being saints that we should venerate, because we're Orthodox Christians, we need to worship them as unifying national figures. They should be the focus of Byzantine unity rather than fighting over their nationality when nationality didn't even exist then. I mean, let's grow up, right? But we don't do that. We have to argue over their identity, like we argue over the identity of Alexander the Great or over Constantine the Great. Enough is enough. While we're arguing, not just now, but back then, the Turks at the gate, right? Or the Crusaders are at the gate. You know, I don't mean to be alarmist and paranoid, but, you know, there are real issues facing this area always. The Balkans are caught between East and West. And we're arguing over this. This is from a Bulgarian postage stamp. Uh, absolutely beautiful. The Bulgarians, are, of all the Balkan peoples, probably honor them the most. But they're guilty of the same hubris of the Greeks and the Serbs and, and everything else. They focus a little bit too much on what they think these two saints thought of themselves rather than what they did. So why is there a bias against Byzantium? Well, Western Christians always resented the Byzantines. They always resented our claim to Rome, right? Our wealth at the time, right? Wealth is always a cause of jealousy and greed because culturally and economically, what was behind the walls of Constantinople was what everyone wanted. Now, we all know what the Fourth Crusade did, right? It sacked the empire. It crippled the, the empire. And the cultural differences were then hardened by an imbalance of political and economic power. The West became wealthier and more powerful, and we became weaker. And one of the things you learn in history is that those with power write the history. So the Byzantines were edited out of the discussion. And we ourselves began to write our history in their image. And it's not something that just happened in 1204. The collapse of Yugoslavia cannot really be understood without referencing Byzantium. The Serbian-Croatian divide has many reasons, but it also has this, the Orthodox Catholic divide. So what about this period of 400 years of Ottoman rule that I mentioned? During that time, all Orthodox were one community, what the Turks called, and you'll have to work with me on the Turkish, the Rum Mileti. Rum Mileti, which is the Roman, is it 
community, nation, nation. So whether you were Serbian or Syrian Orthodox or Greek Orthodox or Albanian Orthodox, you were room. You were one people. There was no border either in the mind or in reality between us all. So people moved around, people intermarried, people spoke multiple languages. We talk about Macedonia. Most of Macedonia at the turn of the last century was bilingual or trilingual and often enough illiterate. And their nationality may be determined by factors like what school they went to. They were all rooms. When you asked what they are, were rooms, were Byzantine subjects of the Sultan. So there was a unity encoded in the whole Ottoman system that we threw out. Because then we went into geographically based and linguistically based nation states. Because the line was very fine before and often crossed because the Byzantine identity was more important than the secular identity. And as more and more of our people migrated to the West, creating the great Greek commercial diaspora, which all of us who are Greek or Serbian or Syrian are part of that diaspora, they continued this identity. They followed this pattern. Discrete national separate identities were later, and they were grafted onto geography and language at a later date, and often via Western influence. This is one of my favorite painters, uh, the Serbian uh, painter Paja Jovanovic. These are Serbians leaving the Ottoman Empire to settle in the Austrian Empire to build merchant colonies and to protect Austria from the Turks. Now, very interesting, a lot of the glories of Russia and Austria were built on the backs of Balkan people. Again, something we don't talk about. Now, my wife is from that group that moved into Austria, and she's very proud of that heritage. And Serbs in America, often enough, don't talk about that heritage. And we Greeks don't talk about the fact that Southern Russia was settled primarily by Greeks and Serbs, that Russian grain was carried everywhere by Greeks. And those same people built fortunes in shipping, which now, where is Greece, uh, where is Greek ownership uh, on the world shipping charts? What number is it? Uno. I mean, China's, China's gaining, but we're still numero uno. It's all part of this heritage. It's all part, it's all connected. We need to contextualize it because it's there. So then we come to the revolutionary era. As all the Balkan peoples are becoming more literate, more articulate, more involved with nationalism in the West because they're traveling more to the West, they're doing business in the West, they're becoming successful in the West, we have to think about what we're going to be. Are we going to be Romney or are we going to be Hellenes? Now, this is one of my favorite streets in Belgrade. Riga od Fere Ulica, Riga Sfereos Street. It's a commemorates Riga Sfereos, who was a merchant from Thessaly, of Vlach background, so Romanian-speaking, Romanian-Greek, Turkish, Slavic-speaking, because if you're a merchant in that era, that's what you do. And he wanted to reconstitute the Byzantine Empire as a federal republic. Do you know the first place that Greek appeared in print in a newspaper? It was in Vienna, in the Greek community in Vienna, and he was one of the editors. Now, of course, as they say in Greek, wherever there's a Thermopylae, there's an Ephialtes. He was betrayed in Trieste by a fellow Greek. 
the Austrians arrested him because the Austrians didn't want nationalism and they didn't want a republic in the Balkans. And they sent him to the Turks. They said, Turks, he's your problem. So in Belgrade, which was still under Turkish rule, they strangled him and threw him in the Danube. And with him died the vision of a united Byzantine, you know, reconstituted Byzantine state. But there were still people everywhere that wanted that. And that's why here it says, Serbsky i Grčki narod, the Serbian and the Greek people, because he's a hero to the Serbs too. Now, many of us know who Rigas Fereos was. Generally, in the Greek American community, do we know who he is? In that pantheon of Greek heroes that we have, does his name ever come up? I mean, is he on a short list? You know, he's not up there with Kolokotronis, right? Or my Hydriot ancestors. I'm from Idra, so we've got some, you know, some pretty good uh, naval heroes. But what about this thinker that could have brought us all together under one common church and one common faith? Not so much, right? We don't talk about him very much. However, during uh, the, the organization dedicated to Greek independence, the Filikieteria, founded where? in Odessa, the Ukrainian port that the Greeks helped to develop. Filikieteria had Bulgarian, Serbian, Romanian, and Albanian members. And Greeks and Serbs fought in each other's revolutions, something we also don't talk about. We were committed to each other's revolutions. And even though now we argue about Macedonia and what it means, in 1821, it meant only one thing. Orthodox Macedonians fought for a free Greece. And then the nation state era. This is uh, when we still lived over in Greece. Uh, it's my boy and I. He was very impressed at the time. Now he's 15 and uh, almost as big as me. Uh, when, I met, and when he said, who built that? I said, your ancestors. He was impressed. I'm impressed, right? We don't, by honoring Byzantium, we don't belittle our ancestors, but I think we have a more complete image of who we are because Greece in the modern era was supposed to be a rebirth Periclean Athens, not a successor to the Byzantines and the Ottomans. The choice of Athens was not accidental, and Athens was a tiny village when it became the capital of Greece. And it wasn't the first capital of Greece. Anyone know what the first capital was? Nafplion, a much more developed city than Athens, with a much bigger port than Piraeus, right? But the choice was made by our Philhellenic king that wanted a reconstituted Periclean Athens rather than a Byzantine Orthodox state. The first king never became Orthodox. Otto remained a Catholic, even though he liked to don the Fustanella. So we were created in someone else's image more than our own identity. And we assimilated that. And it's nothing wrong with being proud of the ancient heritage, but not at the expense of our Byzantine heritage. And certainly the 40% plus, 50% of Greeks who can claim roots either in Thrace or in Asia Minor or in the Black Sea, it wasn't this building that was in their hearts. It was the first building we looked at, right? Hagia Sophia. That's the true reference point of Romeo Sini. It's not that this isn't part of it, but this is part of a continuum. For the modern Greek state, this is it. And how do you explain to a Greek of today, jumping from 2500 BC to today, how do you explain the church, Father, without bringing in Byzantium? Well, it's very difficult. I mean, you know, I would say it's impossible. You have to talk about this. But Greeks did this, and every other Balkan state did a version of it. So Bulgarians 
focused either on their pan-Slavic or pre-Slavic past to the exclusion of their Byzantine past. The Romanians on their Latin linguistic roots as a tie to Italy and to France because that's the West. Now, I can't say I speak Romanian. My son's godfather is Romanian. I, I love Romania, but I speak Spanish and I know that if you just spoke Spanish, you wouldn't understand Romanian because what's the word for yes in Romanian? Da. That's not Latin. Romanian is littered with Slavic, Greek, and Turkish words, just like all of the Balkan languages have Turkish, have Slavic, have Greek. That's their real heritage. But the Romanians dropped the Cyrillic alphabet because the first alphabet of the Romanians was not Latin. It was Cyrillic. They took Latin so that they could be more Western. And Serbia also went the Pan-Slavic route or the, Yugosla the South Slavic route, though Greek and Serbian ties remain strong. But at the same time, in spite of trying to create these states, they were all consciously Byzantine Orthodox. In other words, to be Greek was primarily to be Orthodox. To be Serbian was to be to be Orthodox. So they created these miniature ethno-linguistically specific Byzantiums rather than looking at the larger Byzantium. Nonetheless, there were brief gasps of Byzantine unity. Greek and Serbian relations are generally uh, characterized by cooperation because they didn't have territorial conflicts. Uh, what you generally found is Greece and Serbia cooperated and Bulgaria was antagonistic. And then you had the issue of how you were going to divide Macedonia. But at the same time, this is a commemoration of what happened in 1912? What happened in 1912? The First Balkan War. Four small Balkan states took on the Ottoman Empire and crushed it. And what happened in 1913? It's a tragedy. We fought amongst ourselves. Why do we do this all the time? Why don't we work together? Why don't we think about our common heritage rather than what divides us? I don't have an answer to that. I, I'm sorry. If, if you thought I was going to have one, I don't. Uh, that is the most pressing question that we've never been able to answer in the 200 years that we've been independent. And if we don't find some sort of solution, we may lose that independence because there's a lot going on in the area, right? But in the 1990s, when the Greek economy boomed and the nations to our north dropped communism, all the Greek investment were in these countries. Do you think that was accidental? It wasn't just geography. It was cultural knowledge. And I'll give you a perfect example. We own a home in northern Serbia in this beautiful town called Sombor. It's right next to Croatia, right next to Hungary. Sombor in the, in the 2000s, you know, when we lived there from 2010 to 2013, was full of Greek businesses, you know, major Greek uh, companies. You cross the border into Croatia, nothing. Or into Hungary, nothing. So there was this common culture which created common links. And if you look at the story of Greek and Serbian merchants, they were all in the same areas because they had the same culture. Even if they were competing, they had these common ties. And this Byzantine card, either in commerce or in politics, has never been used. And Greece, as the wealthiest state and the most economically powerful and politically powerful, missed that opportunity. So we need to take that. So what do we do now? Well, first of all, we need to learn the history of our Byzantine ancestors, all of us, anyone that is from a successor state. Now, what do I mean? Like the dates? No. 
but understand the trends, understand the flow and why it's important. Because how can we appreciate our faith? How can we bring people into our faith without contextualizing Byzantine history? And also the the sheer diversity and tolerance of Byzantine history. I mean, you can tell your your friends of Anglo-Saxon background that the guardians of the emperor were refugees from Anglo-Saxon England when the Normans threw them out. There's so much diversity in this culture that we don't bring into our discussions, and we need to. And we also need to start diving into those great stories because there's a thousand years of stories. And that's maybe where historians like me can help, is to find these stories, to tell these stories, to bring, we're in a multimedia age where social media can be asymmetric. We need to start using it. And we also need to call on Orthodox people in Hollywood. I'm thinking of one uh, named Tom Hanks, Mr. Rogers, right? Forrest Gump. He needs to talk about this. He's a devout Orthodox Christian. Somebody, please talk to him about this. The stories are there. The screenwriters are there. There are actors, Greek, Serbian, Bulgarian, Russian, who could tell this story. Let's work on telling this story. And then let's teach others about our history. One of the volunteer activities I do uh, at Clemson is I teach in the continuing education program that has a lot of retirees, and I teach about Byzantium and about Eastern Europe. We can all be advocates for this history, and we need to be, and we need to contextualize it. Why is the fork important? Who invented it? Why, when you go to dance, Greek dance, why is it important? What is this a part of? This isn't something that came from the ancients. This came from a 2,000-year history. It's up to us. And when we're sitting around the table talking about the history of our people, let's throw in stories about the last emperor who died sword in hand. He's as worthy as Leonidas. And he also crossed himself the same way. He didn't pray to Zeus. He prayed to the true God. That's important. That uh, a child in Sunday school should be able to relate to a little better than Leonidas. But it's up to us to talk about that. When do we talk about that? Well, the answer is we don't. And we should. And I am heartened that all of you are here because obviously this is important to you. And yes, and given the weather today, although given your accents, many of you are from the Northeast or the Midwest, uh, right, Jim, from Chicago? So this is nothing. But yet, I thank you all for coming under those circumstances. So Byzantium is relevant. Anyone know where this is? St. Sava's Cathedral in Belgrade. It's the second largest Orthodox church in the world after Christ the Savior in Russia. Of course, if Hagia Sophia were what it's supposed to be and what God intended it to be, it would be the second largest in the Balkans. It's Saint Sophia in splendor, and it is a stamp of the Serbian people because it's a new church that we are Byzantine. It's easily one of the most beautiful churches I've ever been to. And in front is Kara George, a fellow member of the Filikiateria, a contemporary of guys like Kolokotronis, who fought to free his country and his people and his faith. So why is Byzantium relevant beyond just us? Well, the Western abandonment of Eastern Christians, the abandonment of Yugoslavia, right? the abandonment of the Syrian Christians, the abandonment of the Armenians and the Greeks and the Assyrians a hundred years ago, and the continuing indifference to what Christians in Turkey suffer. Because let's let's not forget, 
that was the heart of ancient Christendom. And now it's the necropolis, the Macedonian issue. All of these require an understanding and contextualization of Byzantium. A thousand plus years of history are complicated, but they're worth discovering because it is who we are. For us to understand who we are and for us to be able to explain our faith to people that come into our lives, whether spouses or people we welcome in the church, beyond teaching the Word of God, if we are able to contextualize this great, tolerant, and universal, what did we say today at lunch, Harry? This ecumenical civilization, it'll make our task a lot easier, and we'll be doing God's work. So I invite all of you to continue on this journey, because you're all on this journey. But let's all work together. One final picture. Where's this? Who are they? Go on, shout it out. Serbian revolutionaries. Pajo Jovanovic, first Serbian uprising, 1807. Right? Greek revolutionaries. What's different? Not much. Same mustaches, right? Same priest. The cross, right? Okay, a few more climate-appropriate uh, changes. They're the same people. These are our people. They're Byzantine people. Most people make the same uh, conclusion as Father did, because he's right. They are Greek revolutionaries. They could have been fighting in Greece, and many of them did. And many of these people there could have been Greeks, because Belgrade at that time spoke as much Greek as it did Serbian, because we were all mixed in together. We're all Byzantines. I thank you very much. I'm happy to take your questions. And again, I'm grateful for this opportunity. Yes. Well, I think that part of that's going to be discussed uh, by people that are more knowledgeable. Uh, is that in January, right? So, now, I would, I would say that uh, my, my dear friend Harry made a very good point today at lunch, that what is unique about the patriarchate is that it is not an ethnic church. And I thank you for telling me that because nobody had ever, here's the word again, contextualized it like Harry did. That this is something beyond ethnicity, what we have. So, yes, am I biased that, uh, towards the patriarchate? Yes, I am. But not because at the expense of the other churches, because you're all part of the same church. But... Yes, that unity might be fostered if we were all under one church jurisdiction. But I also think that the, the thought process would be hastened by understanding this common faith and, and heritage and co the common institution of Byzantium. So we'll, we'll learn more about it in January, or those of you who are here, unfortunately, I won't be here to see that. But understanding Byzantium, I think... It road that brings us there, because just as Cyril and Methodius understood that it is one thing to be inspired by the Lord, to be able to understand the Word hastens that inspiration. If that Does that, does that make sense, what I'm trying to say? Right. 
Well, if you're, if you're stronger, then you should be together. This, and the language should be the language of the country. Well, that is very Byzantine, right? Yeah. Uh, and I understand that, and I'm I'm supportive of that. As proud as I am of being Greek, I'm a citizen of Greece. I was in the military in Greece. I'm proud, you know, of that. I'm here. I'm an American, and I agree with you. Now, having said that, the value of Greek is that it is the language of the New Testament. The value of Serbian is that it was a language that helped to bring in a whole nation and group of nations into the family of God. So that can never be separated. But in order for us to all communicate uh, in a common way, I think that that's very, very important, and I'm very supportive of that idea. Absolutely, I appreciate that. Yes. How many chairs of Byzantine history do you have in major universities in the States? That I don't know. Uh, and that's actually something that I need to take away from this to find out. There are. Uh, Oftentimes, it's Byzantine and modern Greek studies. I mean, I can think of three or four that's... I, mean, I know Spiros Brionis, the late Spiros Brionis, uh, uh, chaired Byz Byzantine and modern Greek studies. I don't know whether it was that at Davis, UC Davis. I think it was in California. I'm not sure, but the answer is not enough. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something that's probably a bit heretical, so... Please don't repeat it uh, back in Clemson, right? It's like, uh, but yeah, it's on the tape, so I might as well say it. <laughs> now I basically started it, so let, let's finish the point. Academia is very important, okay? And fostering uh, studies in academia is very important, but I'm also going to put on my marketing side because i uh, you know, my late parents did finance uh, a number of degrees for me, uh, God rest their souls, uh, and thank them, I thank them for that. Uh, I think that we have to be able to market our culture in a way that's not necessarily academic, but is more asymmetric and more contextual, and sometimes academia doesn't do that job, if that, if that makes sense. Uh, I, I think that's sometimes where conventional wisdom, where popular culture can play a very important role. And, and blessedly, Greeks do have a role in American popular culture. I think that we can use that platform and now start to shift it. But that's where, that's where first of all, economically powerful individuals in our community and culturally powerful individuals <laughs> are absolutely vital. And we've got a number of those individuals in our community, both locally and nationally. And, and I really invite you all to, to start being asymmetric and having that kind of a discussion so that we can get this, this story out there. Yes. I'd like to comment something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've had discussions with them. And they do not claim to be Byzantines. They claim that they are the, I guess, daughters and uh, sons of Jason from the ancient Greek expedition over to the Black Sea. And I don't understand that. Would you care to comment? Sure. Um... That is very interesting. And again, that goes back to the founding mythologies that we all have. So they may have been, the first Greeks may have been from Jason and the Argonauts. That doesn't preclude them being Byzantines. I mean, the fact of the matter is, yes, you know, these, uh, you know, the, the ancient Greeks were our ancestors. But that doesn't mean that the Byzantines were not our ancestors. It's part of a common thread, right? Uh, if, yes. If I may add, uh, they claim that they have come from the kingdom of Trapezon. 
Okay, now, Kingdom of Trabzon was a Byzantine successor state. It broke away in the aftermath of the shattering of the Byzantine Empire. The Pontians have the eagle that came from Byzantium. They're a Byzantine successor state. My brother-in-law's Pontian, they would never argue that. Most of my unit in the Greek army were Russian Pontians. Uh, again, very proud of their regional identity as Pontians, just as people from Hydra are very proud. Cretans are very proud. Uh, uh, people from Constantinople are very proud, and I, I think they're sort of primus inter pares because they're the, as we would say in Greek, the protebusiani. They're from the capital, right? Um, that's what I told Nula Rodakis, uh, and uh, she appreciated that. But they are Byzantine successors. The empire of Trebizond was ruled by the Komneni, which was a Byzantine dynasty. They spoke Greek. They broke, uh, it was a political reality that they had to be a separate state, but they never ceased to be part of the Byzantine family. The Bulgarians are a separate state, often at war with other Byzantine states, both then and now, but they're part of the Byzantine family. Uh, they can argue about it. I'm happy to argue about it with them. They're Byzantines. Does that answer your question? This was my argument against it when they were quite pedantic about it not being Byzantine. <laughs> well, and I know others that would be that would uh, argue that they are very much Byzantine. And that's what's the saying uh, that there's uh, two Greeks and three political parties. So, you know, we're a fractious lot, right? I didn't know that. Um, I mean, I know that there are, you can study, uh, for example, in Georgetown, where I did my undergraduate, you could. Uh, well, and a lot of the Catholic colleges do because, again, um, the Catholic colleges are very strong scholastically and have a very strong sense of history. Now, they may, they may view Byzantium, they may study Byzantium to view it in a way different than we do, but nonetheless, uh, they do believe in academic freedom, so we can argue with them our point of view. Uh, again, Scholarly work is absolutely necessary, and I also think that it would be a very good idea for us to bring in and translate scholarly work that's done <clears throat> in the University of Thessaloniki or the Byzantinology faculty at, uh, at Belgrade University, which is world class, or uh, I've read and reading German is, wow, it's difficult, they have long words. The, Byzantinische Zeitschrift, the Byzantine magazine that the German Byzantinists uh, uh, produce. There is a huge corpus of scholarship, but in an era today where everything comes on your news feed, right, you need shorter, more asymmetric information. I mean, I love reading a long history book. It's, uh, it's one of my many eccentricities. But even though I'm studying history, I don't have time to, and most people don't. We need to be able to download, to use a, a current term, and contextualize this history to make it stick. At least that's my opinion, and, and maybe that's not the best solution, but it's probably the more... Uh, the most um, reasonable solution given the realities of today. Anything else? Yes? Uh, this, uh, the book I have here, it's more of a travelogue. Okay, so I chosen, I've chosen several parts of the Byzantine world that I've either studied, traveled in, lived in. Now, I've had the great fortune to have lived in Greece, to have lived in Serbia, and to have lived in Bulgaria. So there's a focus on that. I've had the great fortune to 
travel in Turkey. Now, I wrote this book in 2011. I had not traveled to Smyrna, uh, which was a wonderful experience. So my experience in this book is limited to Constantinople for Turkey, but I talk about the Byzantine enclaves in southern Italy. I talk about Macedonia as a totality because I've been to Greek Macedonia, Bulgarian Macedonia, and nor uh, former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. Uh, I have Kubari who are from there. Uh, my brother-in-law is a Macedonian. I'm a southern Greek. I've uh, lived in Bulgaria, I've been to Bulgaria and Macedonia, so I focus on that as a region. I focus on the Peloponnesos because most of my background is from the Peloponnesos and Idra. I focus on various areas of, the, of this uh, Byzantine world. I, I focus on parts of Serbia separately because I know those areas more. But there's no real timeline, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And I try to. I try to avoid that. Uh, the best depiction of the breakup of Yugoslavia was given to me by a Greek Serbian cameraman uh, in his home in Novi Sad, Serbia. And he said, There are no clean accounts and no side is telling the truth. So when you start with that, you can start distilling the stories. And, and that's the beauty of travel and a travelogue. I try not to draw too many conclusions. I mean, my only conclusion is I'm an Orthodox Christian. I'm a Greek. I have this great love for Byzantium. And that bias is throughout. But to say who was right or wrong, even vis-a-vis -vis Greek and Turk, it's a dangerous, uh, you're starting down a dangerous road, if that makes, if that answers your question. Right. Uh, let me let me add a personal note to that. My wife was two weeks during the siege of Sarajevo, and she got out on a Yugoslav military plane. So she carries that memory, that visceral memory, everywhere. And you're right. Ski slopes, uh, you know, the Olympic spirit, and then going to bombardment and snipers. Uh, that's why we need to know this history. So that when you hear about this afterwards, you don't draw the conclusion based on the latest uh, BuzzFeed report, right? Oops. Can you give me the... Oh, thank you very much, I uh, appreciate that uh, very much. And I'd like to ask Father now to give the benediction and all the other accolades you want to bestow on Thank you, on Thank you very much. I mean, first of all, first of all, just to say uh, thank you for being with us. And I think it's evident we'd love to have you come and offer a whole series of you know, the history of the Balkans and uh, so on. And, would you like to perhaps consider taking up residency here in Naples? Uh, we I love that. I'm afraid to show pictures <laughs> to my wife because... Uh, <laughs> would somebody be sure to send him as many pictures as possible? Okay. <laughs> Let's close with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, how great thou art, O Lord, and how magnificent are the works of thy hands. We praise you, we bless you, we glorify you, we give thanks to you for your great goodness. Lord God, Lamb of God, you who came to take away the sins of the world, hear us, we pray, and have mercy. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to amplify the voice of Alexander, 
on the history of Byzantium in our, in our Orthodox Christian faith and values and culture. And we thank you and ask that you would richly bless him for his focus, his devotion, and his, and his scholarly study in this area. We ask this in your name, if you're holy and blessed to ages of ages. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Father.